Welcome to Follow Him, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping individuals and families with their Come Follow Me study. I'm Hank Smith. And I'm John, by the way. We love to learn. We love to laugh. We want to learn and laugh with you. As together, we follow Him. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Follow Him. I am your host, Hank Smith. I am here with my illustrious co-host, John, by the way. Hello, John. Welcome. (laughs) Hank has a different adjective for me each time. (laughs) I gave Hank a thesaurus once, and not only was it terrible, it was terrible. Yes, I had to go get a new one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Hey, we want to remind everybody uh, to come find us on Facebook and and Instagram. We've got some extras on there John and I are doing. Uh, We also, uh, for those of you who are uh, listening, there is a YouTube version if you'd rather watch us. You can also get show notes and transcripts at followhim.co, followhim.co. And of course, we'd love for you to rate and review the podcast. That really helps us out. Um, So, John, uh, another week and another expert in church history. So uh, tell us who we have here. It's great. I'm so delighted to be here. This thing has changed my Doctrine and Covenants. I thought I'd read it before, but it's just a blessing for us to be here and to have Dr. Kenneth L. Alford here. Um, Let me read what I've got here. After serving almost 30 years on active duty in the United States Army, uh, Brother Alford retired as a colonel in 2008. While on active military duty, Ken served in numerous assignments, including the Pentagon eight years teaching computer science and information systems engineering at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and four years as a professor of behavioral science and department chair at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. After serving in the England-Bristol mission with my sister-in-law, he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Brigham Young University, a Master of Arts in International Relations from the University of Southern California, a Master of Computer Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a PhD in Computer Science from George Mason University. He has published and presented on a wide variety of subjects during his career, and Ken and his wife, Shirley, have four children and 18 grandchildren, and we're so happy to welcome you today. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks. I should probably clarify that uh, your sister-in-law, sister-in-law and I were in the same mission, but were not companions. That was, uh, that was yeah. yeah, that sounded kind of funny. That, that, I just want to just want to be really clear on that. <laughs> and Linda was not my sister-in-law at the time either. That happened like she came home, married my married my brother. So we found out we had that uh, connection, which is which is great. So now is this accurate? Four children, 18 grandchildren. Every, that number seems to change with almost everybody we bring on. That's uh, that's the accurate number. Um, you can kind of see the group behind me. I've yeah. um, got a family photo there, there they are. from a family reunion <laughs> and uh, heading for another family reunion this summer. John, I've known Ken for Oh, Gall, it's been 10 years now, ever since I came on to uh, campus at BYU. Uh, And he has been, honestly, uh, always so kind to newcomers. I I don't know why that is, Ken. Maybe it's just a natural thing, or maybe someone did it to you a long time ago. But you were, um, well, I stepped foot on campus, and you came over to say hi and meet me and find out who I was. And then we found out that we had, you know, mutual family with my sister-in-law, Lisa, I think is your cousin. And we just connected there. Um, (laughs) Is that just something you've always done? When you're in the army, you're always the new guy. Um, My wife and I moved our family, I don't know, 15 or more times in a 30-year career. And so you're always showing up as the new guy. Um, Our BYU faculty is actually the fifth fifth faculty that I've been a part of. So <laughs> even academically, you're always, always the new guy. So I kind of, kind of have an empathy, I think, for being the new guy, because I've been the new guy so many times. <laughs> nice. Yeah. You, I remember first, first day I, I was like, oh, I have a friend. I have a friend. It, it makes a difference. You know, you feel like us as adults, we don't, we don't worry about that sort of thing, but no, it's, it, we do. And it, it feels good. Um, 
So uh, before I uh, let this happen, I just want to make our listeners aware that Ken is not only a church history and doctrine expert, he's also a war history expert. And we have a war history lover in our co-host, John, by the way. So they may go off on some tangents at times talking about World War II. John, we haven't talked about your dad very much. Where did he where did he serve? Um, my dad enlisted in the Navy two days before his 18th birthday in 1944. He went to Camp Farragut in Idaho to learn how to march in straight lines, uh, other important stuff. And then he, he got on a train to San Francisco, a bus to San Francisco Bay, and boarded the USS Saratoga CV-3, the largest carrier in the fleet at the time, and uh, saw action at uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, their ship was attacked by kamikazes. He stayed at his post. He was on a quad 40 anti-aircraft gun and uh, 123 killed, 196 wounded that day, February 23rd, 1945. Um, was not a member of the church, but had some buddies that dragged him off his bunk and said, you're coming to church with us. And when he got home, he thought I should date some some, as he put it, some LDS girls. And uh, one of those ended up being my mom. So it's a really interesting story how even in those kinds of times, the Lord can uh, intervene and make wonderful things happen, even in difficult, very difficult times. So I could I could go on all day, but that's the, the one paragraph uh, nutshell. So World War II from 44 to 46 in the Pacific on the Saratoga. Well, I wanted to ask maybe... Brother Alfred, about his, his was was the military something you always wanted to do? Was it uh, something that helped you get to college? I mean, how did how did that all come about? My father was a reserve officer, um, so when I I was born when just before Dad graduated from BYU, and then uh, when I was just a couple couple weeks old, we moved to Harlingen, Texas. He went to navigator school training down there. I learned to, to walk while he was at nav school training. And then we got stationed in Alaska when I was little. It was a territory then, so I'll betray my age. My sister's birth certificate says territory of Alaska. Wow. <laughs> and then we, that's when he was on active duty. Dad used to fly with a B-50 along the Bering Strait, um, taking in air samples from the Soviet Union, proving that they were doing nuclear tests. And, wow. uh, then we moved back. To, we moved. Dad got out of the service, uh, went into the reserves. We moved to Ogden. Yeah, but uh, my whole growing up, Dad was in the reserves, so he would disappear summers and Christmases, going over to Vietnam and and uh, various various places. And uh, and so military was just kind of a kind of a thing. And then I went to high school at Ben Lomond High School in Ogden, Utah. And mm -hmm. Ogden, Utah was one of two cities in the entire nation. The other was Walla Walla, Washington. And if you went to high school in Walla Walla, Washington or Ogden, Utah, you took ROTC as a sophomore. It wasn't optional. If you were a male, you took ROTC. And so I took ROTC and I, I liked it and uh, had basic, you know, military um, familiarization from my dad. So I continued uh, through high school ROTC. It was a battalion commander there and and then uh, applied for a scholarship for ROTC at, at college and uh, got the scholarship, went to BYU on Army ROTC scholarship and then graduated into the Army. And the Army, just every single time we asked for something, the Army just said, OK, <laughs> it was just it was just amazing. Um, and so the the Army lets you do you, anything you could do in the civilian world, you can do in the Army. And uh, and so I wanted to be a professor and they let me be a professor a couple of times and and uh, sent me to school and did all kinds of things. And I turned around and 30 years almost had passed. And then we then we got out. The Army was very good to my family. Um, the saying within the Army is the Lord knows where he wants your family to be. And then he whispers to the Army to send you there. <laughs> <laughs> and that that seemed to be the case with our family as we moved just mm -hmm. all over the place. And and uh, it was it was a, a, a great experience. Although if you ask our children where they're from, they kind of just look at you. <laughs> they're they're not, not, quite, not quite sure how to answer that, although most of them, I think, would yeah. say, say probably Virginia because we had three tours mm -hmm. in Virginia. All right. Well, let's jump into our uh, lesson this week, Ken. 
Uh, we're studying sections 85, 86, and 87, which seem to me, uh, because of your help, which seem to me to be kind of standalone sections. There's, they don't really run together like some of the others we've, uh, we've, uh, we've seen, you know, right in a row. Let's back up as far as you want uh, and tell our listeners what they probably should know before heading into section 85. Well, sure. Section 85, you have to remember at this time that, boy, poor Joseph Smith, he's trying to run the church with two church centers, if you like, for lack of a better description. And the Internet is still down in 1831, 32. It's, it's going to be down. It's going to be down for another 150 years. And and so it's really tough. I mean, just try, can you imagine trying to communicate and organize and and on top of this, you're trying to organize and run the law of consecration in the land of Zion in Missouri. And so he's deputized basically some folks and given them authority, David Whitmer and others, who's the president of the church in Missouri. And and he's he's Joseph has traveled out to Missouri and they're trying they're just trying to, you know, build the church in in Ohio, they're trying to build the church in Missouri, and they're having challenges in both places, to be quite frank. And and boy, it, it's got to be frustrating to be Joseph because he's only got, um, you know, at this stage in, in church history, he's got two bishops. But fortunately, he has two bishops now. Um, he started with none. And in Missouri, what's happened is they have, when Joseph went out, they... Um, Take W.W. Phelps, William Wine Phelps, and uh, just a little bit about W.W. Phelps. He's he's uh, one of those guys you hear his name a lot. He's from New Jersey. He actually wanted to run for lieutenant governor of New York at one point. Um, it's kind of fun, his connection to the church. He buys a Book of Mormon. Talk about interesting timing. He buys a, his copy of the Book of Mormon on the 9th of April, as I recall, like three days after the church is organized. So the church is three days old. He buys a copy of the Book of Mormon. He's reading it. He doesn't meet Joseph, though, as I recall, until, oh goodness, it's almost Christmas in 1830. And then he waits six more months before he's baptized. And he's baptized, as I recall, in June of, of 1831. And then he is called to go out to Missouri. And he goes out to Missouri to make a long story short. They buy a press um, and it's set up in independence. And then Joseph is, is told by the Lord to send um, Oliver Cowdery and John Whitmer with the copy of what's called the Book of Commandments and Revelations. And this is a, a record, kind of a master copy of the revelations Joseph has been receiving. They take that out to, to Missouri and W.W. W. Phelps very painstakingly begins setting that type in a little teeny book. It's only about this big. And it's called the Book of Commandments, because if we go clear back to section one at the beginning of, of the Come Follow Me year, the Lord in those initial verses says, this is my preface, and he names it the Book of Commandments. So W.W. Phelps is working on that, and he, he's publishing that. And so he's out there in Missouri. Joseph is back in Kirtland. Now, section 85 is, is written down. It's actually a letter. It's an excerpt of a letter from Joseph Smith to W.W. W. Phelps. Now, we're presuming that W.W. W. Phelps must have written a letter first. And what's happened is right before this, this is the end of November, 1832. And Joseph has just come back from a mission up into southern Canada and up into upstate New York. And while he's gone, his mail is stacking up. You know, that, that happens when you don't have email. And, <laughs> and so he's wading through all of his mail. And he must have come across a letter from W.W. W. Phelps. Now, that letter's been long lost. Um, hopefully they'll find it someday, but currently that letter is lost. We can presume what the letter says based on Joseph's response. And he writes back to W.W. W. Phelps and gives him some counsel and, and advice on church members in Missouri and also how the law of consecration is to be run and what records are to be kept and, and those kinds of, of things. And in this letter, 
Joseph, Joseph says this. He says, while I dictate this letter, I fancy to myself that you are saying or thinking something similar to these words. So he puts a question into W.W. W. Phelps' mouth, and it says, what shall become of those who are assaying to come up unto Zion, so those people that are coming to Missouri, in order to keep the commandments of God, and yet receive not their inheritance by consecration, by order of deed from the bishop, agreeably to the law. And then he says, so I've assumed you've asked that question, W.W., and now I will proceed to answer your question. And so the letter, and by the way, you can find the text of the entire letter. If any listeners are, are interested, just go to the Joseph Smith Papers website. It's josephsmithpapers.org. And you can actually find under the revelations, the full text, the original letter of Joseph. And you can see the parts that were cut out that actually become section 85. And so in there, then Joseph, there's, there's a, a fun reference in verse six, um, where Joseph talks about, he says, yea, thus saith the st still small voice, which whispereth through and pierceth all things. I just think that's a great description. Just a, a just a fun description of the Holy Ghost. Cause when the Holy Ghost speaks to you, it just kind of it just kind of pierces you, you know, it's, it's, it's still and it's small, but the Holy Ghost has this great ability to just get your attention. And then Joseph goes on and says in the letters, and oftentimes it makes my bones to quake while it maketh manifest. So that when I feel the spirit, it just kind of just kind of makes me shake all over. It's just, you know, so exciting that it's that it's happening. And at this time, the law of consecration in Missouri is being organized, if you like, by the, the first bishop in the church. That's Edward Partridge, who was a hatter, by the way. And uh, he, he made hats for a living prior to becoming a bishop. And, uh, and so he's out there. And Edward Partridge, he's, you know, for a while, he's the only bishop in the church. And now he's been charged with running the law of consecration. If you go back and remember section 51, he gets instructions from the Lord on how to do that. And there's various sections that you've talked about in previous um, episodes that talk about the law of consecration and things. But Edward Partridge, this is a, this is a good man. He, you know, he, the Lord says, this is a man in whom there is no guile. He just has no, he just doesn't have a deceitful bone in his body. And he compares, the Lord compares him to Nathaniel, uh, you know, one of his ancient apostles. And so, but, but Edward Partridge isn't perfect. He's like the rest of us. And Ed, Edward Partridge, quite frankly, comes in and out of favor, if you like, with Joseph, um, depending, because the Lord says earlier, I'm going to paraphrase here, but basically the Lord says, when it comes to the law of consecration, it's my way or the highway. You have to do it my way or the law just won't work. And as they're trying to work through some of the problems in Missouri, Edward Partridge is, is maybe being just a little creative and trying to figure some of these things out. And plus they have people that won't join the law and there's just lots of challenges. They're, they're receiving persecution. But at this time in November of 1832, Joseph considers from what he, he knows that Edward Partridge needs to probably toe the line a little bit more. As when it comes to the law of consecration. And, and so, and, and, and he does, by the way, there's several things in later revelations and also other writings of Joseph where Edward Partridge just, he's, he's just such a, such a great guy, but, but he needs a little course correction right here. And so Joseph offers that course correction in this letter that is excerpt um, in, in section 85. And what he says is, is in verse seven, the letter says, and it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong. And basically what he's telling Bishop Partridge is, Bishop, I've called you to do this. You need to do it. You need to rely on the spirit, but you need to follow the guidelines and exercise and, and execute the law of consecration as it's been laid out. And if you don't do that, I will send someone mighty and strong who will help you out. And then he goes on and says, um, while that man who was called of God and appointed, so Bishop Partridge, 
that putteth forth his hand to steady the ark of God. And that, of course, is a reference to poor Uzzah back in First Chronicles, what, chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. This is a guy that's following the ark of the covenant as Israel's on the move. And the ark, you know, it's on a wagon that's apparently a little bit rickety. And I don't know, they hit a bump or something happens and the ark shifts. And so Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark and keep it on the wagon. Well, that's verboten. You're not allowed to touch the ark unless you're, unless you're, you know, of the proper cast of Levites and in the, in the right order and all those other rules that are found in the Old Testament. But Uzzah takes it upon himself. And basically what Uzzah says is God isn't capable of protecting the ark of the covenant. I'm going to have to do it for him. And so I'm going to override the rule and I'm going to put my hand out and steady the ark. Uzzah touches the ark and <laughs> <laughs> he's 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 killed and and so you don't steady the ark um you know and that's kind of a we've got that metaphor in the church of not steadying the ark i was gonna say ken it's it, that's become kind of a uh i've heard it at least in my in in my church experience don't steady the ark and that's where it comes from, is from that, that first Chronicles story. In fact, David O'McKay made this statement. Um, I, I like this. He said, it's a little dangerous for us to go out of our own sphere and try to unauthoritatively, and that's the key, to un- unauthoritatively direct the efforts of a brother, or I would add a sister. See how quickly those who attempt unauthoritatively to steady the ark die spiritually. Now, when I was growing up, um, I think each generation, you know, has they play favorites just maybe a little bit. And one of our favorites was was Neil A. Maxwell. And Elder Maxwell said it this way. He just said, quote, prophets need tutoring as we all do. OK, but then I love this line. He says, however, this is something the Lord seems perfectly quite able to manage without <laughs> requiring a host of helpers. <laughs> and, and isn't that a great line? You know, yeah. none of us are perfect, not even the prophets and apostles, but but it's not our position to steady the ark. And and so wow. this th- the statement in that section um, today, we look at it, we go, OK, uh, Bishop Partridge got that counsel. He repented of whatever he was not quite doing right and and absolutely did a great job. Um, but I've got to tell you. In the first 75 years of the church's history, and especially around the period of the manifesto into the period of Utah's early statehood, that phrase from verse seven, (laughs) one mighty and strong, really became kind of a touchstone as different groups left the church um, for various reasons. Often it was because of plural marriage. When, when, When the keys to plural marriage were turned off, there were some groups that didn't agree with that and, and they left the church and they, they, some of them used that phrase one mighty and strong to say that that was their leader of their breakoff group. And so, so much so that interestingly, this isn't known much today, but, but in um, the Deseret News, which is uh, owned, owned by the church in the 11 November issue in 1905. So the church is just 75 years old. But in November of 1905, the first presidency published a very long, for a newspaper, a very long explanation about that phrase, one mighty and strong. Wow. And they felt so strongly about it that they republished it almost two years later in the October issue of the Improvement Era in 1907. And here's what the first presidency had to say about that phrase, one mighty and strong. Quote, perhaps no other passage in the revelations of the Lord in this dispensation has given rise to so much speculation as this one. Well, wow. I mean, in, in yeah. the, the 115 years that have passed since then, I've, that's I've kind never of heard it. Yeah. Calmed, calmed down a little bit. But yeah. this th- that phrase, one mighty and strong, was a major um Concern and, and cause of speculation because people were saying, well, who is that? And then various groups were saying, well, it's our guy. But, but in that, in that publication that the church put out, 
they very painstakingly, and again, this is it's available. You can find it on the internet if you're looking for it. But very painstakingly, they just lay out and say, this is talking about Bishop Partridge. He repented. One mighty and strong isn't wasn't needed. The Lord didn't have to execute that second part of that clause. But I just find it, I just find it interesting that, that twice this was of such a concern at the time as they're trying to, you know, turn that key off for, um, plural marriage with the manifesto and then what some call the second manifesto just after the turn of the century that, that it's a, it's a cause of concern and, uh, just, Kind of a kind of an interesting note from section eighty five yeah. to something that we don't as we read it today we we don't have we that same would've... visceral reaction to that phrase in in verse seven yeah i would that's not one I would have said, oh, I remember that phrase coming up in nineteen o five I hope um, you don't remember that phrase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want, we don't want to offend any of our listeners, but we do want to help people understand what steady the ark might look like in twenty twenty one um, where we go to, sometimes we want to go offer the bishop our unsolicited counsel. Is that, or I've had a dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, the Lord told me to tell you, you know, this, and I remember responding, if the Lord can't get through to me, he usually tells my wife. <laughs> I have learned great respect for the keys. And as, as, as a bishop, I had a, uh, a former area authority teaching gospel doctrine in our ward. And whenever I happened to have the chance to go to gospel doctrine, it, he was so respectful of the keys. He always asked me, Bishop, I want you to have the last word today in gospel doctrine. And I also have learned when I'm going to do a fireside, I find the person with the keys and I say, this is exactly what I'm planning to talk about. Um, is that okay? And if you would like to make any closing comments, of course, you know, I'd welcome because because I um, I understand that idea and I, I've learned that uh, maybe things don't happen the way we think. But I have respect for the keys. And I think I showed that when I was given a chance to give them my sustaining vote. So I always try to be try to be careful of that. I don't know. That's my two cents. I like it. Yeah, priesthood keys are 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 so important. And if you look at it, there's very few actual key holders in the church. It's a it's a very small number of, of key holders. And we share um, I, I teach religion um, 225 at, at Brigham Young University. It's foundations of the restoration. And in one of our early lessons, we share some basic principles with the students regarding revelation and, and just how the process works. Cause you know, the Lord is so organized and so orderly and, and things function so well. If you do it, according to that section 52 talks about his pattern. Um, but one of the principles we teach them is what we call the, uh, the law of stewardship or the principle of stewardship. And, and basically it's that we can each receive in individual revelation and, and absolutely should, as President Nelson continually challenges us to, to do and to prepare and to recognize how we hear him. Um, but at the same time, that revelation that we receive has boundaries. And our stewardship, if we are receiving revelation for those who are outside of our stewardship, especially those who hold priesthood keys, then you can take it to the bank that that revelation probably isn't coming from the source where you hope it is coming from. Um, it's kind of like what happened in the early days of the church. Uh, I know you, you discussed this in an earlier, earlier episode about Hiram Page and, and his seer stone. Because Hiram Page, I think, was trying to do the right thing. You know, he'd been told we can all receive revelation. The heavens are open. And and so he goes out, takes a seer stone, which is a common thing to have at the time and asks for revelation. And he receives it. He just unfortunately receives it from the wrong source because it's early and they're still learning as well. But but I don't see that 
you know, Hiram Page was trying to mislead the church. He was just misled and deceived himself. But if he'd understood that stewardship principle, and if you look in the early sections, especially of the Doctrine and Covenants, boy, it's over and over and over. I, I, in section one, it's just multiple times. And, you know, section 21, right while the church is being organized. And basically, just to paraphrase, it says, Joseph is the guy. That's rule one. And rule two is, see rule one. <laughs> Joseph is the guy. And and so as long as we keep that in mind and today, you know, it's it's President Russell M. Nelson. And if we keep that in mind, we'll recognize that, you know, the Lord is never going to tell Brother Alford what President Nelson needs to tell the church. That's just not going to happen. It's just it's just not going to happen. I remember I had I taught early morning seminary for several years in several states as we moved around. And in one of my classes in Virginia, one of my one of my really, really great seminary students came up to me after class. He, he hung around and, and he was going to about to miss the bus to, to go to high school. But he said, Brother Alfred, I need to tell you, how do I get in touch with the prophet? It was President Hinckley at the time. He said, how do I get in touch with the prophet? Because I have a message from God for him. I received it last night in, in while I was dreaming. And I know it's a message. I, I need to tell him that he needs to change something. And so I, I didn't call it the principle of stewardship at the time, but I sat down and kind of explained how things worked and that actually, no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> um, the other thing I tell my students is if you find yourself on the steps of the church office building with people with protest placards and they're shouting down the prophets and quorum of the 12, you're in the wrong crowd. You need to leave. And, you know, it's just the, the way, the way this works, stewardship and revelation and keys. It's such a wonderful thing, but it can absolutely be misused or abused if we don't understand the Lord's process. Yeah, and, he, and he's organized it for that specific reason. So we can know. Right where this comes from. And I've seen it happen for me, Ken, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've seen it happen where men who hold the priesthood think that somehow because they hold the priesthood, they direct, they can direct the women of the church in no matter what position they're in. And that again is a matter of priesthood keys. You may hold the priesthood, but that doesn't give you any, any stewardship at all over the, the young women's president or the relief society president, uh, be you holding the priesthood. You're not the key holder. The bishop is section 121 defines that it's two words, <laughs> unrighteous dominion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we, I'm glad steady the ark. What an, that's such an interesting phrase. Um, that, uh, you, but you know, interestingly, if you look at, if you look at the old Testament, does anybody else ever touch the ark recorded in the scriptures? <laughs> Not that. Yeah. No, no. Uza Uza becomes the, you know, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the role model on what to do. But, but I think the message gets out at least on that point, Israel has other problems as, as we still do today, but touching the ark doesn't ever seem to be a problem again. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, the Lord is here. He, the Lord said X. Uza did why? He and he he paid the consequence. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great concept. Steadying the ark. We just need to make sure we're we're, su we're supportive of church leaders and not trying to supplant them. What do you call that, John? A sermon in a sentence? Is that what you've called it before? Uh, yeah, I, I yeah, I've noticed when I mark my scriptures, I usually mark phrases, not entire verses. And sometimes you'll see a a sermon in a sentence, and that's that's one. Uh, that's one of those. I'm going to look up a quote real quick. Do you guys remember who it was from? Somebody in conference, I think it was Elder Anderson said, don't be more interested in changing the church than changing yourself. Well, it, it reminds me while you're looking that up of Alma to Corianton. You know, you worried about this. You marvel about this. You think this is unjust. And then at the end of his four chapters, he says, let not these things trouble you. Only let your sins trouble you. <laughs> You're worried about the wrong thing, son. <laughs> Sometimes when I've read that steady the ark, I've thought, you know, just between us, gosh, that seems kind of harsh. She was just trying to help. But I guess that that was... Um, the commandment not to do that was well known, right? Uza had to know that they, the way they did rules back then and teaching back then, I mean, things were pretty clear 
pretty clear cut with the law of Moses. And, and so Uzzah must have known what he was, what he was doing, or I don't think the Lord would have exacted that, that penalty. Um, well, you know, Re Revelation's an interesting thing. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a balancing act, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you don't want Revelation, to, you don't want to let it um, swing too far to the left or too far to the right. President Oaks tells a, a wonderful story. I may get some of, the, some of the details wrong, but as I re recall the story, a young lady comes up to him and, uh, and is just so excited. And she says, I'm, I'm, I've just... I'm dating her. I've married this, this most wonderful person. And he's so spiritual. He prays about when we go to the supermarket, he even prays about what kind of beans we should buy. And, and president Oaks <laughs> said, Oh, sister, basically the Lord doesn't care what kind of beans you eat. <laughs> you know, Del Monte and green giant are both okay. <laughs> and, and that there's a, there's a line of things you, things you pray over. Um, I remember, um, having one missionary acquaintance in my mission field that prayed over what tie he should wear every day. And quite frankly, it's elder, you got a blue one and a black one and it, they're both <laughs> going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, at, at the same time, sometimes I think we don't bring the Lord in on decisions that, oh, I think he's just waiting to help us out. And, and we have to, we have to, I think, sometimes initiate that conversation by asking. Um, I've, I've had students tell me that, you know, they, they didn't feel the need to pray about who they were marrying. And in my mind, if that's not one you pray over, I, I don't know what rises to the level of requiring assistance from the Holy Ghost. Um, so, and each person's different, you know, and, and I think about the things I prayed over when I was five and six and the things I pray over now, and, and I be real honest with you, they're very different lists. <laughs> um, and, and so I think as we go through life that, that that list changes and heavenly father understands that. And, and as we mature in the gospel, our, our prayers change, but, the, a couple of just a couple of I guess concluding thoughts on that is first how wonderful that it's available. Oh my gosh, how wonderful that it's available! The gift of the Holy Ghost, you know the the Lord calls it an unspeakable gift, and that's just the best definition I think. It's just an unspeakable gift. It can tell you all things, and. And it's our responsibility, I think, to figure out how the Holy Ghost can best help us and where, you know, when we, when we trouble, <laughs> trouble him and, and, and when we don't. And there, there is, you know, some things that definitely no and some things definitely yes and some things that are in the gray area. And if, if you're concerned about it, my advice is pray and ask the Lord, you know, for assistance on what's concerning you because, the, the Lord has our best interest always at heart. And, and he knows what our needs are, as it says, you know, before we even ask in the scriptures. And, and so it's, Revelation is just an interesting thing. It's easy to go off the rails over Revelation questions. And so, again, I think the Holy Ghost is the one that keeps us on the rails in this and just absolutely everything else. Yeah. I, I think Joseph Smith, in my mind, is the... The just a, a prime example of a key holder in that he would tell people what the revelation he was receiving by priesthood keys, but he always directed people go to the Lord, ask him yourself if this is correct, if this is right, have your own experience. So as a priesthood, if I'm a if I'm a priesthood holder that holds the keys to you know stewardship, the keys of the priesthood, um, I should have no fear of people going to the Lord themselves and, and getting a second witness of, of what I'm directing them to do. There shouldn't be any fear there or, or even, you know, being offended that someone wants to go to the Lord for themselves because, you know, because I already told them what to do. I love what you said. There's a delicate balance there. And uh, well, I think, was that the same talk elder Oak said you have two lines of revelation. You have your personal line to the Lord and you have your priesthood line to the Lord. And they, they, you have access to both. So uh, Edward Partridge um, 
was faithful to the end after this. And does that idea negate the idea of one mighty and strong coming along, making this prophecy kind of a conditional thing if Edward Partridge didn't do what he was supposed to? Well, that first presidency yeah, um, that. publication twice from 1905 and 1907 addresses Edward Partridge in detail. It addresses his situation. And, and the first presidency said this, they said, the man who was called and appointed of God to divide into the saints their inheritance, Edward Partridge, was at the time Joseph wrote, so this is in, in November of, uh, 27th of 1832, at the time was out of order. That's the phrase the first presidency used. Neglecting his own duty and putting forth his hand to steady the ark. Hence, he was warned of the judgment of God. And the prediction was made about another one mighty and strong. Okay. But then it goes on to say that in the midst of these times, Edward Partridge acted a most noble and self-sacrificing part and bore many indignities with the greatest patience. He was taken to the public square of independence, partly stripped of his clothing and bedaubed with tar and feathers amid the jeers of the mob. He neither complained nor murmured at this treatment but bore it well with meekness and dignity. He was one of five others to offer himself as a ransom for the church, and he told the mob he was willing to be scourged or killed if they would let the rest of the saints go. This is after the letter. I mean, he, he comes back. And then the first presence, he continues further in that letter and says, who shall say that his repentance, his uh, Edward Partridge, his sacrifices, his sufferings and faithfulness did not procure for him a mitigation of the severe judgment decreed against him in the revelation contained in the 85th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. At any rate, the Lord said some three years later that he was well pleased with Edward Partridge. And and so, yeah, Edward Partridge, in fact, after he is just brutalized by the mob there in front of the courthouse in Independence, which is just down the street from W.W. W. Phelps Press, um, Edward Partridge never really completely recovers. And and he dies. Um, he dies, uh, I believe, about seven years later as the church is entering into, into Nauvoo. He just never, never fully recovers. Um, but he was, he was willing to do that. And so that statement about the one mighty and strong, it, the first presidency, the gist of what they were saying is it's, it became null and void. Uh, yes. In, in the 1830s, that became null and void. We are not looking for one mighty and strong to come forward today to grab the scepter and save the church that Edward Partridge rose to the occasion, repented, and the Lord accepted his repentance and 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 was Edward Partridge was one one of the truly good guys in this dispensation. Yeah. Ken, you're doing something I love here, which is protecting protecting our our the saints of the past, protecting their name, protecting their reputation. Uh, there's so many who want to focus on their weaknesses. If you wanted to, you could write a book on Edward Partridge and all the things he did wrong. Uh, and the, the book might be factually correct, but you, you would not be judging him. Uh, you would not be judging him correctly. He's a great, you would, you man. would miss the man. You would, yeah. you would miss the man. Um, I, I, just a quick story I love about Edward Partridge is, the Lord reveals the law of consecration in section 42. You know, there's those verses starting about verse 30 and then some later verses, but, but it's not a lot of detail. And, and then Edward Partridge as Bishop is, is given the instruction um, comes from the Lord through Joseph to go up to Thompson, Ohio, when the Colville saints arrive and basically put the law into practice. He's a hatter. He, 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 you know, he can make those Colville Saints hats and they'll look really stylish, but, but he's not a lawyer. He's not, he's not a real estate agent. And so he, I'd love it that he's willing to tell Joseph, Joseph, I, I need some instructions. I, you know, how am I supposed to do this? What, what does it mean? And the Lord, I just love section 51 in the book of commandments. Somebody wrote on it. Uh, don't publish or not to be published or something like that across <laughs> the top of the page. And I'm so glad that they did publish it. The W.W. Phelps typecast that and put it into the, the book of commandments because the instructions that W that uh, Edward Partridge receives enables him 
to begin executing the law. And, and, and he's, yeah, I, I think, I think Edward Partridge is one of the real heroes from the early years of the church. I mean, the first bishop called in almost two millennia. <laughs> um, yeah. What a staggering responsibility. Yeah. And um, we can do the same thing with our leaders and our bishops, right? I mean, when when our bishop is up there and, and he's we see, oh, he may be doing something we wouldn't say or he's doing something we wouldn't do, we'd say, well, he's... This isn't, he wasn't seeking this position. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't, hopefully I can run the ward soon, right? I'm, I've, I have a wonderful bishop. He's in human resources, right? That's his employment. And he's doing things that, that he did not probably want or ever, you know, thought he would do, but he's doing them. And it's not my place to correct him. I just think he's, he's got a great soul and I'm amazed at all the sacrifice he offers. One of the things I learned when I was bishop about about steadying the ark was I, I learned that bishops know a lot of things that nobody else knows. And I just thought after like a couple of months, I was like, you know, I am never going to question again because there's just other things that nobody else knows about what's going on that you're trying to navigate. And I just thought. I'm just not going to, I'm just going to support the keys because I, I know that there's things that I don't know. And, and I, I think we, I, I love that we can trust the Lord to communicate with his leaders. I guess just one parting shot and the thought on section 85 is, you know, yay for, for them writing these things down, yay for them saving them, you know, um, Today, I think we don't commit enough. Our, our conversations are, are on email and they disappear. Our, our conversations are over the phone and they disappear. Um, our conversations are, have been on Zoom in the last, uh, last year or so and they disappear. And there's something to be said for, for permanence. And if you look at the words of prophets and apostles and their counsel, there's frequent and repetitive counsel to keep journals, to keep, you know, whether it's a gratitude journal or a daily journal, or whatever it might be, but to, to record some of these things. And quite frankly, there have been times in my life when I'm really great at journal keeping. And there have been times in my life when I'm not really great at journal keeping and being good at journal keeping. It's better. It's at this stage in life. It's so much fun to be able to go back and check something and go, oh, you know, I had remembered that a little bit wrong in the years. But there it is recorded on the day it happened. And that's that's the way it was because I recorded it. <laughs> I recorded it then. And so I think I think maybe um, the, the fact this is not Joseph's only letter in the Doctrine and Covenants. There are actually several letters. I mean, section 127, 128, there are letters, uh, section 122, 120, uh, 121, 122, 123. There's lots of lots of letters. And and so I think there's something to be said for us just remembering that we need to record uh, you know, much of our life so that our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren can benefit from that. Yeah. Um, I just had the opportunity over the past year during the pandemic. One of the projects I took on was um, taking my mother and father's journals. Um, mom's turning 90 this year and dad just turned 91. And, and they've got 7,000 pages of journals that we've turned into PDF pages for all of their posterity. And it's so much fun to be able to just have that record. And, and I will confess it has spurred me to be more, more diligent in my, my record keeping. And so I would just, I would just give that as a, you know, I, that's not one of the direct messages out of section 85, but I think it's an ancillary one that that's just useful to remember. Yeah. Let me mention a paragraph from the Come Follow Me manual before we go forward. It says, the history described in verse one recorded the names of those who had received inheritance inheritances legally in Zion. However, this history was more than just administrative. It was also a valuable record of the saints, quote, manner of life, their faith and works, close quote. That's from verse two. And then the Come Follow Me manual says, are you keeping a personal history or journal? What could you record about your manner of life, faith and works that might be a blessing to future generations? 
how might this history be a blessing for you? So I think that's exactly what you were saying, Ken. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go now to section 86. Can you give us some backstory and background of what's happening uh, before we dive into the verses here? You bet. Section 86 actually follows section 85 uh, just by a little more than a week. It's the 6th of December, 1832. And we don't know absolutely for certain, but there's enough little breadcrumbs and clues that, that lead folks to conclude that this section looks like it clearly comes out of Joseph's work on the, what we call today the Joseph Smith translation, which the Doctrine and Covenants calls the new translation or simply the translation. So just very briefly then, Joseph um, has Oliver Cowdery purchase a Finney Cooperstown Bible, as it's called today, an 1828 edition. And then there are various scribes, and Joseph uses that. He calls it the main branch of his calling for a period. And it's the way that the Lord does a couple of things. Um, first, he teaches Joseph additional things about the gospel. Joseph learns a great deal about gospel principles during that translation. He also receives numerous revelations. Oh my goodness, there are dozens of revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants that tie either directly like section 76 or indirectly like section 91 to the translation of the Joseph Smith translation. This is one of those sections. And so what happens is they, they start doing the Old Testament and then in section 45, Joseph's told, hey, you're asking great questions on some things. Go do the New Testament. So they leave the Old Testament alone. Go do the New Testament. Then when they finish that, they go back, pick up the Old Testament, and then reach the Apocrypha in section 91. And that's another story for another day. Um, but they have done, they have gone through the New Testament for the first time about a year before this revelation is recorded. Now, interestingly, it looks like from the record that we have of Joseph's work on the Joseph Smith translation, that Joseph made no changes to Matthew 13 regarding the parable of the wheat and the tares. The first time Joseph went through it, they just didn't make any changes. And so what, what it looks like was happening here in December 1832 is that Sidney Rigdon is once again with Joseph as, as scribe. By this point, as they're reviewing the, the material, Sidney Rigdon is the main scribe. He's assigned that responsibility in section 35. But by this point, Frederick G. Williams is serving as Joseph's primary scribe as he's kind of touching up and working on final edits of the Joseph Smith translation. But for whatever reason, Sidney Rigdon um, comes in and is helping Joseph at this point. And we know that because it's in, it's, uh, in Sidney Rigdon's handwriting. And what happens is it looks like Joseph just receives additional guidance and inspiration about those verses in Matthew 13 in the King James Version. And Joseph receives this information. And what he learns from section 86 is that this is very much a parable of the last days. It has an application for the early apostles. And when the Savior gives that parable, if you turn to Matthew 13, the apostles ask, because it's also after the parable of the sower, those two parables, parable of the sower and parable of the wheat and tares kind of go together. They're in, in almost neighboring verses in Matthew 13. But the apostles don't understand either one. And they ask the Lord, please help us out. Tell us what they mean. And so Jesus explains both of them to them. But what we learn in section 86 is that through the years, there's been a major error creep in to the, the Bible as we have it today regarding the parable of the wheat and the tares. Because in the Bible, it says that the, the wheat and the tares are there and that what will happen is in Matthew 13, 30, it says, gather ye together. So go out and do the harvest, gather ye together. And in Matthew, in the Bible, it says first the tares. Well, the Joseph Smith translation and Doctrine and Covenants 86 now absolutely turn that around. And what it says in Joseph Smith, Matthew is first the wheat into my barn. 
Or as it says in section 86, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. Then ye shall first gather out the wheat. Now think about the way the gospel is being, you know, shared with the world in these, the latter days. Are we going out and gathering wicked people, people that are trying to tear down the church? No, (laughs) we're gathering those that are seeking Christ. And our, our invitation is to invite all to come into Christ. And that doesn't mean that someone that, that was doing something wrong can't repent and, and straighten up and join the church. But those that are actively working against the cause of God, you know, the way the Matthew account is, is they're supposed to be gathered first. And that's just not the, just not the mm. way it works. And it's also, so I think it's helpful to remember with section 86, there's a statement from uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie in the doctrinal New Testament commentary. He kind of talks about parables. Because I think sometimes we think that parables are designed to enlighten us and, and make things crystal clear. No, no. And, and Elder McConkie points out very clearly, he says, parables seldom clarify a truth. Rather, they obscure and hide the doctrine involved so that none but only those that are already enlightened and informed are able to grasp the full meaning. And then Elder McConkie said, nowhere is this better illustrated than the parable of the wheat and the tares. When Jesus first gave the parables, even the disciples didn't understand it. They asked for an interpretation and he gave it, well, partially. The Lord still had to give a special revelation and that's section 86 in the latter days. So the full meaning of this marvelous parable might sink into the hearts of men. So as you look at section 86, the question, I guess, is what new things do we learn in section 86? And I think the big thing we learn is that it's the wheat that's gathered first. We're looking for people that want to come unto Christ. That's that's the key. Gospel will be offered to everyone, but we're seeking those who want to come unto Christ. But section 86 also teaches who the the sower is, because the parable talks about a man going out and and sowing. And section 86 clearly says that's the apostles. They have that responsibility. And if you think of what an apostle is, it's a special representative of Christ, you know, whose mission is to help us come unto the savior. Um, It also clearly defines in section 86 who the enemy is. And it, it says very clearly it's Satan, it's Babylon, it's the world. That's who we're, that's who the tares are. It also defines, see, and this wouldn't have made a lot of sense to the apostles back in the meridian of time because there had been no apostasy. But he talks about in section 86, the apostles falling asleep because the apostles were killed and an apostasy occurred. And it talks about the church in the wilderness, which wouldn't have made a great deal of sense probably to those early apostles. That's the apostasy. It helps us better understand what it means to be tender wheat. Um, Section 86 defines it as weakness or newness in the gospel. You know, people whose testimonies are still maybe a little shaky and and developing. It also helps us, I think, see a little bit clearer that tares are, you know, not just those that fight against the church, but also, you know, probably also evil doctrines that they're espousing. And then it talks about the harvest and the burning. And and now in this dispensation, that's the millennium, which is, you know, going to be a, a, a key, a key point in this dispensation. And it points out that the angels are, are anxious to reap and, and Wilford Woodruff and others have had comments about, about that. And so section 86, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful section that the Lord takes. It's the doctrine of covenants is sometimes a wonderful commentary on other scripture. And this is a classic example of the, the doctrine of covenants being commentary on, in this case, the Bible, Matthew chapter, chapter 13, um, one other thing that we get uh, from Joseph's work with the Joseph Smith translation that figures into this because it talks in section 86 about the end of the world. And in Joseph Smith, Matthew, um, uh, or you can go to the Joseph Smith translation, both because Joseph Smith, Matthew, of course, is just excerpt from the JST. But it, it says there in Joseph Smith, Matthew one verse four, that as he Christ sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be which thou said, which thou hast said concerning the destruction of the temple and the Jews, and what is the sign of thy coming? 
or the end of the world. And then Joseph adds this wonderful phrase in the Joseph Smith translation, or the destruction of the wicked, which is the end of the world. And so we, that's also, I think, alluded to in, in section 86, that it's talking about the, the end of the world. You know, there've been lots of people. We always have that image of the guy with the long beard and the sign, you know, walking around. The end <laughs> is near. Well, the, the end of the world is the destruction of the wicked as, you know, preparing us for the millennial, the millennial reign of the savior when there will be, when you're not going to have to lock your car. Yeah. You're not going to have to lock your front door. Okay. Um, and, and people that were in the military like me are going to be out of a job. <laughs> There's not going to be a need for, they won't make war anymore. Oh, I um, love it. And so, so section 86 is just, it's just fun. I just, I just really love it when the Lord kind of takes Joseph and he puts his arm around him and just kind of says, Hey, I'm going to pull the curtain back for you. Yeah. I love it. So yeah. let me, let me pull it back. These scriptures have been there. People have been reading for thousands of years. I'm, let me pull the curtain back. Here's what it means. And I just love that when that happens. And Section 86 is a classic case. Elder Maxwell called that like exploring a new room in the scriptures, right? In, in your own house where you, you find a new fireplace to be warmed by. Um, uh, I wrote a book on parables. It sold dozens of copies, mostly to my mother. But I learned something very important in verse three that I have has impacted me. He, he, he even, he throws in Ken, the Lord throws in, in verse three, a little bit of the parable of the sower when he says the tares or the weeds choke the wheat, um, in verse three. And if you go to Matthew 13, verse 22, it, this is how that happens. How do tares choke the wheat or saints? He says, these are people who receive the seed, um, but the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. And that's a place where I stop with my students and say, what are the cares of this world? And what are the deceitfulness of riches that can, that can spoil our faith, that can choke out our faith? Uh, there is so much to learn there because as I become more and more worldly, right? As I get caught up in, in whatever's happening in the world and I, I just don't have time for the Lord. It's not that the soil's bad. I've just got so many other weeds in my life that the testimony doesn't get any time. It doesn't get any sunlight. It doesn't get any resources because, hey, I've got a lot going on, right? I've got, I've got, a, I've got seasons on Netflix I need to watch. Uh, I've got, you know, I've got professional basketball games recorded. Uh, I don't think this is a, these, this is bad people. This is when I allow the, what did you call it? Is it the doctrine of the world? I think you called it, Ken. Uh, to just choke my life. It takes all the resources, takes all my time, takes all my energy. Um, and that, oh, it both, it has scared me. And I think the parables of Jesus, Elder McConkie was right. Um, he veils the meaning. And then when you see it unveiled, it should scare you <laughs> because then you find out you've got a lot of changing to do. Well, and once you understand it, then you're responsible for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think Elder McConkie also said uh, he made a comment about the parable of the sower and talked about that that type of soil. He called it the four kinds of soil because really it's more about the, the soil than it is about the sower. Um, but he said that uh, the, the, the place where it fell among thorns with the weeds is good soil as evidenced by the growth of the undesirable plants, but... He he used the phrase, but the chair the tears end up choking them. Maybe he got that from section eighty six. Instead of be overcoming them, they get choked by the tears. And I just wanted to add that um, I came across a book years ago called Money for Nothing. It, it was about people who had won the lottery in Michigan, and uh, there were a couple of chapters. A few chapters in this book where people who won the lottery said, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And one guy said, I made some investments and I spend my life now with lawyers and lawsuits every day. Another person said, we used to shop at this mom and pop grocery store and they were so nice. They'd always put a couple of extra oranges or extra apples in our bag. And now that they know we've won the lottery, nobody does that anymore. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And whenever I talk about those weeds, the deceitfulness of riches that you mentioned, Hank, I always like to say, how are riches deceitful? 
And if you think, if I just had that, then everything would be fine. Well, no, it, it just it gives you a new set of problems, maybe, <laughs> uh, in, in some ways. And that's how they can be deceitful. <laughs> People are saying, and I know, Joe, uh, Hank, you've got lots of jokes about money can't buy happiness. But I thought, you know, these people are saying, yeah, I want a million dollars. It's the worst thing that's ever <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. And it seems that the Lord knows. Um what did Paul say? The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Uh, man, Ken, I really love this this section now. It's it's a fun section. And the, the Joseph Smith translation is just filled with nuggets. And when you get yeah. something in the Doctrine and Covenants that expands what's in the Joseph Smith translation, it's a double win. It, right. It's just it's just very cool. It's one thing to have. Uh, a commentary right about uh, the parables. I tried that too, Hank, but to have the savior <laughs> comment on his own parable, it's like having a Benedi comment on Isaiah. Oh, thank you. A prophet can comment on this prophet. That's hard to understand. Uh, that's so helpful. Ken, I really liked when you talked about verse four, the blade is yet tender. It says it again in verse yeah. six. The blade is yet early tender. days of the church. Verily, yeah. your faith is weak. Um, yeah, that this is a brand new little church, uh, and he's the Lord is kind of sheltering it. You can say he's trying to protect it from from those tears. And we can do the same thing for new members, for children and youth, right? Protect those tender testimonies from uh, from the great persecutor of the church, right? Verse three. There's a great, uh, great phrase from Elder Holland, and I, I, I would have to look up which talk it was in, but I remember the phrase, and he says, it's always 1830 somewhere. Mm. And I love that phrase that somewhere in wow. the world, it's always mm. 1830. There's just a little band of saints. The gospel has just barely been introduced there. And the blade wow. is yet tender, you know, tender and young. And and uh, so I just think, you know, wherever wherever you are listening to this, that probably not not too far away, that there's either, you know, a branch of the church where it's like 1830 or there are individual members of the church where in their family and their home, it's like 1830. Yeah. They've just received the Book of Mormon. They're just learning these doctrines and and the, you know, the wheat is still, it's still tender and tender yeah. and green. I love it. And we can do a lot to protect those tender, uh, those tender blades. Please join us for part two of this podcast.